I just want to say how uh, thankful I am to the elders to, uh, and to the, uh, Tim and as well as the congregation, you, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here before you. But before we get into it, let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Father, I thank you for this morning that you've given us the opportunity to meet. Um, and Lord, I pray that through your word, you would, you would speak to us, soften our hearts, that we would uh, be open to hear what, whatever message you want to speak through me this morning. Lord, I'm your servant. Speak through me and do your will. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. So the elders, you know, like I said, Tim texted me saying, hey, you want to teach? And like, you know, like he said, I responded, I was like, yes. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, no. Huh, huh. Where's the unsend button when you need it? Uh, but, you know, I was praying about it. I'm like, hey, it's too late now. Uh, but I was, you know, praying and thinking, and like, Lord, what would you have me, have me say? And you know, I was like, really kept on praying that we really don't get enough good old-fashioned fire and brimstone teaching around here so buckle up i got you now no none of that i, I was lord's been speaking to me um trying to teach me something lately and i want to pose a question to you uh, what is your number one priority what's your number one priority now in all reality this is not a fair question why? Because we're at church. So, if I say at church, what or who is your number one priority? The answer is God, God Jesus. Yay. It looks like I don't have to teach after all. Go home. <laughs> but it, it's not fair because we're in church and we say God and Jesus. And, but I think it changes depending on where we're at. If your boss comes up to you and says, hey, what's your number one priority? Uh, well, it's job or, or meeting standards, making sure, you know, increasing revenue, whatever the, the, the job is, then that becomes the number one priority. Or, or fellas, if your spouse comes up to you and says, hey, what's your number one priority? Yeah, you are, babe, you know? That's the right answer. <laughs> it's a safe answer. And, and, it, but it changes. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, my family and raising my kids right and, and providing, or maybe it's money and make sure I can, you know, afford things. And it changes constantly. Now, now, should it change? Of course not. It should be God, and if it's him, it should be him um, alone and always. And let's look at why. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things uh, will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, to understand a verse, you have to understand the context of what it's talking about. In, in this, it's the Sermon on the Mount, is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And we're in the middle of it, and Jesus has been talking just before this about anxiety. He's saying, do not be anxious for anything, not even about what you're going to eat or drink or wear, let alone the other things. You know, he says, look at the lilies of the field and how God causes them to grow, the birds of the air, God takes care of them. You know, how much more is your father going to take care of you? And in the middle of saying, hey, don't be anxious, he says, but instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, we see, you know, okay, Scripture says, seek him. And then some of us think, well, I'm already a Christian. That means I've already sought him and I already got it. But the idea, the translation's kind of uh, lost a little bit with English. It's the idea of continually seeking first the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness. Now, what we could do is focus on how. We could look at, all right, so it says seek God, and it's to, uh, the idea of continually seeking him. All right, well, how do we do that? And... I don't want to do that for two reasons. The first of all is that then it becomes a checklist if we look at the how. You know, we look at Scripture and it says, all right, how do we do this? All right, now it says meditate on His Word day and night, so therefore we need to read the Bible, pray continually, pray without ceasing, sing praises to God, um, you know, live in fellowship with one another, and we can say, all right, guys, here are the things. Make sure you read two or three chapters a day, read through a Christian book a week, uh, sing five or six songs, pray in public, pray in private, all right, here you go, here's your checklist, blah, 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 have a good Sunday. Um, but then, who here likes checklists? Nobody, really. Gigi is my wife. She is the <laughs> queen of checklists, uh, whether it's for the grocery store or whether it's, you know, things you got to get done during the week. Make up the list. And then why do we like checklists? Because we like that sense of accomplishment, you know? You get those four things, you know, you check them off, you're like, yes, it's been a productive day, productive week, because I've done these things. We get this sense of fulfillment and validation. Look what I've done. But, and it's not a bad thing, 
but we can't treat God like that. Then we start treat, treating God like a checklist and say, all right, I'm a good Christian because, look, I've done this, this, and this. And because of these things, that, mean I'm, that means I'm seeking him first. Yay, me. You know, congratulations. Uh, I'm good. But, like I said, then, but instead of seeking God, we're just seeking that sense of accomplishment, that sense of fulfillment, the feelings we get from accomplishing the checklist. And it's, it's, instead of our priority being God, it's just this self um, validation that we feel from it but the second reason is that in all reality you don't need to know how don't need to know how to seek god why well let me put it to you this way how many of you in college or in high school ever took you know how to pursue your boyfriend or girlfriend 101 and some of you maybe did you're like actually <laughs> kind of embarrassed by that i didn't even pass but you didn't because no one needed to tell you how. I and mean, when you started dating your spouse, you wanted to know more about them. So what did you do? You started spending more time with them, asking them questions about you know, their hopes and their dreams, about their past and their wounds, and you wanted to get to know them more. You spent time with them, talking with them, going to different events with them. You wanted to do everything with them and just be with them. When you're married, it's the same thing. It's even a deeper intimacy and, and constantly being around and with each other. And it's that pursuit. The how comes, is a natural response from a desire to know. And it's the same with Christ. When you have a desire to know God, when you desire to seek him, the how just comes naturally. And so we don't have to worry about, all right, how am I going to seek God? When, when he's your number one, when you're seeking him first, it's the natural response. So instead of looking at how today, we're going to look at the three reasons that, that I can, when we look through scripture, that point to why. Why? Do we seek God first? And the first being this. We seek God first because there is nothing greater to seek. There's nothing and no one greater to seek because God's a person. He's not a, a human, but he's a person with, with which we can have a relationship. Let's look at Matthew 13, 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a, mount, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. A quick definition here. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God you see throughout Scripture are very interchangeable. They're talking about the same thing. Um, but what is that? Let's look at Romans. Six, or 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, because at that time the Jews were concerned, oh, should we, can we eat this? Can we drink that? People are doing this and that, and they're kind of you know, um, getting on each other for it. But he says it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, isn't, we're, talk, we're not talking about heaven one day, pearly gates, golden streets. We're talking about the presence of the Lord right now. If you are a Christian, you're a born-again believer, you are part of the kingdom of God. You're part of the body of Christ. It's the presence of God. When it's talking about seeking him first, when it's talking about the kingdom of God, is that treasure, it's that presence, that oneness that we have from being a Christian uh, believer in, in Christ. So back to Matthew. What does this guy do? When he finds his treasure, he flips it out. In, in all honesty, he's like, oh my gosh. He sells everything, everything, so he could buy this treasure. He's like, he, you know, he makes sure it's hidden again, so that way that treasure is his, that came his number one priority. His main purpose and pursuit in life was to make sure he had that treasure. And that's what the kingdom of God's like. There's the, the presence of the Lord. There's nothing that beats it. He realized this is, this is what matters. This is what I need in life. Now, we could, we could talk about this for days, about how great and awesome God is, and how there's no one greater, nothing out there that even compares to him. Any sermon you hear, whether it's Tim or, or you watch something or hear someone else, constantly speaking to this point, how our Father is loving and compassionate, how he died for us, how he took our, how he took our sins, how he's forgiving, and, and all of these point to how amazing and good our God is. I mean, we could... You know, give testimony after testimony about the healing he's done in our lives, the way he saved us and brought us out of our sins, the, the way he's changed us, all speaking to our great and wonderful God and how it points to him being above all else. I like the way Hebrews says it. If you go through the book of Hebrews, uh, a number of times it talks about how Jesus is better. And it says he's better than Moses, he's better than angels, he's better than the prophets. It even says... Jesus is better than Aaron. I know. I was like, eh, are you sure? 
but alas, he, he is. And it's talking about Aaron the high priest. But even he's, he's even better than Aaron. It's amazing. Uh, um, and, and so what, we could look at a whole lot of different verses that speak to this, but I want to uh, look at a psalm. It's, it's one of my favorites. Psalm 113, 5 through 9 says this. Who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with the princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. And that first line there, who is like the Lord our God? He's asking a rhetorical question, saying there's no one like the Lord our God. Then he paints a picture for us. He's saying, you know, this amazing creator, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and yet he's going to humble himself to know the things that are happening in earth, things that are happening in, in your life and in mine. He wants to interact with us and be with us. He, he comes down, and, and I like how it says that he lifts the poor and the needy from the dust and the ash heap. And he doesn't just lift us up and say, all right, you know, Go back to your dust. Go back to your ash. You know, have fun. But then he sits us with princes, people that we don't deserve to be with. He puts us in that place as he blesses us. And then that last part there, the barren woman abides in the house as a joyful mother of children. And then he declares, hallelujah, which is translated, praise the Lord. There is no one like our God. You can search all your life, and you're never going to find anything better out there. Which speaks of the second why, the second why we seek God, not only because he is so amazing, there's nothing better, but because when we seek him, we are fulfilled. When you seek the Lord, you are fulfilled. Look at the second half of Matthew 6, 33, like we were looking at. Seek first the kingdom of God, the presence of the Lord and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Now, I know some of you are thinking, all these things, eh? Oh, I really want a boat, you know, does that mean all these things? Or, uh, you know, I want a new place, I want a new car. Uh, you know, Aaron, this sounds good, preach on, I like this, all these things. Um, don't get ahead of yourself. Look at the context again. The context is key, is king to understanding a scripture. He's talking about the, the things, that, you know, we're anxious about. We're always anxious, oh, what, how am I going to provide for this? How am I going to take care of this situation? There's an issue, and I'm going to go and solve it. It's becoming the number one issue in my life. He's saying, God's going to take care of that if you seek him first. All these things are added on to you. Some of you may not still believe me. So let's look at a further definition here in um, Psalm 3410. It says, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. No good thing. That is good news. Uh, you know, the lions, they are at the top of the food chain. But even they go hungry every once in a while. They can get whatever they want, pretty much. But even every once in a while, even though they're seeking you know, food, even they go hungry. But when we seek the Lord, we lack no good thing. Just so you know, a remodeled kitchen or bathroom or a boat or a car is not inherently a good thing. But let me put it to you this way. If you, if you seek a boat... I don't know what I'm saying, a boat. I mean, I don't have a truck. It's not like I even pu could pull a boat if I wanted to. <laughs> Couldn't pull it in with my Mazda. It just wouldn't work. If you seek a boat or whatever, you know, that thing that you're like, ah, oh, I really want that, you you'll probably find it. But you will still find yourself lacking. You'll still be saying, man, I have this thing that I really wanted and desired, but there's still something missing. And that good thing, because when we... Re when we seek him, we are fulfilled. We find that he is all that we need. We, we are complete in him because he is our everything. Again, all these things are added unto you, not from seeking those, but from seeking Christ. We lack no good thing, not because we're seeking the good things, but we're seeking God. And when we have God, there's nothing else that we need. Look at, it, it reminded me of uh, the band U2. Everybody probably familiar with U2 been around for 40 years they've been making music and for 40 years they have been on top of the music industry they are one of the most um highest grossing bands of all time over 170 million albums they have sold and i haven't even sold one song yet so you know um, i got some catching up to do 22 grammys more than any other band in history and yet the edge their guitarist and bono the singer get together and write the words to the song called, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. They have anything that they want. They have everything that they want. 
In the song, they're talking about, no, I've been everywhere and I've done everything. Anything that we have on our bucket list, uh, man, I want to go to this place. I want to have this thing. I want to make sure these things are taken care of. They've done it. They have it. Or that thing that you're like, yeah, I want that boat. They have that boat. Or they could buy that boat if they wanted to. And yet they're like, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Why? Because they're, they're lacking. Because they're not seeking God first. I don't know their spiritual place and where they are. But is Christ your number one priority? When, when you seek God, you lack no good thing. Now, I don't want to give you the picture of, all right, well, God is, you know, this amazing God. He's good, and he, but he's, he's distant. You know, he's this amazing God, and if I seek him, I'm fulfilled, but, you know, I'd probably have better luck climbing Everest in a swimsuit and flip-flops than, than you know, seeking and finding God. This is just going to be a long our life, continually seeking means I'm always going to have to seek but never find, and maybe when I get to heaven, it'll all be good. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. And let's look at why. The third, why we seek God. Not just because he's amazing and, and because we're fulfilled in him, but because he is seeking you. God is seeking you. You're probably familiar with James 4.8. It says, it says this, it says, draw near to God and what? And he will draw near to you. God's going to draw near to me? This amazing creator, this, he's so loving. Why would he draw near to me? In Matthew, it talks about the, 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 the kingdom of heaven. It's like that treasure. I, I, and that treasure, sure, that's worth you know, selling everything for and going after and seeking out. But I'm not that treasure. I look at my own life, I'm like, no, I, I'm not worthy to be sought after. I've failed here and there, and there's things about me. I, I'm, why would God seek me? But he does. The God of the universe, our amazing creator, is seeking you. Some of you may be cynics out there, and you're thinking, all right, well, draw near to me, or draw near God, he's going to draw near to me. It's probably like I'm at one end of the football field, and God's at the, under, uh, at the other end. I'm going to have to go 99 yards, and he's going to go one. And technically, we both drew near to each other, but maybe God wants me to do all the work. Um, but let's look at Scripture. If you ever have a question like that, see what God has already had to say about it. Um, we're going to find the answer in the parable of the prodigal son. You're probably familiar with it. My dad likes to call it it's the parable of the gracious father and his two lost sons, because the parable is more about how uh, good of a father uh, how good the father is rather than how messed up the sons are. But basically, to summarize, there's a man who gives us the, uh, makes us think that he's, you know, he's well off, and he has two sons, the youngest of which says, Dad, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm done with you. I want, to, I want my money. Give me my inheritance. I, I'm out of here. And the father says, all right. So he divvies up his inheritance, and the son takes off. In verse uh, 13 here, of Luke chapter 15 says, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Your translations may say wild living or reckless living, but he is out there doing whatever he wants. I mean, give any you know, young man a lot of cash and he's going to blow it. And I'd blow it in a day. I'm like, yay! But you know, basically this guy, I mean, goes to Vegas and does whatever he wants. You know, stays in the nicest places, goes to see the shows and all the clubs. He is everywhere. He's having a great time. Now, what's he seeking? He's just seeking himself. He's seeking pleasure. He's seeking um, anything that's, that's just going to make him feel good in the moment. And, and he probably had a good time. You know, while he's out there partying, you know, he had, oh, I had fun doing this and fun doing that. But what is he left with? Where is he in the end? He's eating with pigs. How many of you have that on your bucket list? Uh, eating with pigs, man. I got to do that one day. I hear it's a riot. But no one's jealous of the guy who's eating with pigs. It, it, but he sought himself, his own pleasure, and he's left with nothing. He realizes what he's done. He realizes the sin, and he says, I'm going to seek out my father. I'm going to go back to him. Hopefully he hires me on. Hopefully he's going to accept me. But he decides I'm going I'm to seek him out. And what does the father do? In verse 20 here, it says this. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, 
his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him while well, he was a long way off. Imagine the father, he's sitting there on his estate in his rocking chair and way off in the distance he sees a figure. Right when he sees him, he knows, that's my boy, that's my son. He's seeking me out. Now what he could do is say, you know, my son hurt me. He has done wrong to me. He wished I was dead. I'm just going to wait here. Maybe I'll make him, you know, crawl on all fours or something and beg to take that I'll take him back. But he doesn't. The moment he sees him a long way off, he runs out to him and embraces him and kisses him. He calls him his son and he throws a party for him. He's like, wow, my son is back. Even though he was a great way off. A lot of times we think, you know, God wants me to be good enough or to really come to, you know, I, I got to do all this work. But no, our father is loving and compassionate and he ran out and he embraced him. Even the older son who, you know, the father throws a party. Everyone's having a great time. Yay, the son is, you know, my son has returned. He was lost and he's found. And the older son is outside the party saying, I'm not going to go in there. And what does the father do? He doesn't say, all right, good riddance. No, he goes out seeks out his older son as well and wants to reconcile him unto himself as well. Our Father seeks us out. We serve a pursuing God. Now, conclusion. I know, right? We're already there. Um, but it comes down to this. If you seek God, you will find him. Seek God, you will find him. Because our God, he wants to be found. He wants to be found. How do I know this? Let's look at scripture again. Second Chronicles 15, verse 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit of God came on Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. He will let you find him. God wants to be found. He's not saying, okay, come on, seek me, but I'm going to make this hard. You know, you get close. Oh, oh you're, you keep going, keep on coming. No, he wants to be found. He has this desire for you to seek him. You know, he's saying, hey, turn around. Come on, seek me. Here I am. He's going to let you find him. Now, Judah at the time was in a tough spot. I mean, they were, the nation was divided between Israel and Judah, and Judah is at war with everyone, you know, with the Philistines, with Israel, with everyone around them. They've had some good kings, they had some bad kings, and they've, you know, uh, served false idols, and they've um, worshipped other gods, and they're in a tough spot. So, the Spirit of the Lord sends, or God sends the prophet to, to the king, Asa, and says, hey, if you seek me, you will, I'm going to let you find me. Now, imagine if, if Texas were its own country. Don't go, don't go crazy, but just imagine Texas were its own country. I know some of you are praying for that, but I'm not. Anyway, um, and we were enemies with America, Canada, Mexico, with all the Central American and Caribbean countries. You know, we would be in a tough spot. And we'd still win because we're Texas, of course, but, you know. <laughs> But we'd still, you know, there would be, talk about anxiety. And, and, and Judah is in this place where, man, we, we need to worry about, you know, uh, having enough food to eat and having, making sure we're safe from all of our enemies here and protected. And, and yet, God says, if you seek me, you will find me. And as Paul Harvey said, let's look at the, the rest of the story. What happens a few verses later in verse 15. All Judah rejoiced concerning the oath, for they had sworn with their whole heart and had sought him earnestly, and he let them find him. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. Who here wants rest on every side? Now, if you just seek rest for, for rest's sake, and, and we do, I'm, I'm going to seek peace just in and of itself, you won't find it. It doesn't say Judah sought peace. They sought, you know, it doesn't say they sought, you know, military strength or having a good harvest that year. They sought the Lord, and He gave them peace from seeking God. We, we see the why. Scripture says, seek the Lord. Why? There's nothing else. 
There's no one better. Search all your life, you're going to come up empty because there's no one who, ful- who fulfills us like our Father. When we seek Him, we like no good thing. No good thing. We still may kind of be like, ah, oh, but, but, I, but, but I don't have that boat. <laughs> the Father knows what you need, and you like no good thing when we seek Him. And at the same time, He is seeking you. The great Creator Father is seeking you, and He wants to be found. He wants us to find Him. I want to invite the, the band up as we are as we close out here. I want to read uh, a scripture from Deuteronomy um, and close in prayer. Now, the, you know, it's from, from Deuteronomy all through the New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, God has been say, saying, seek me. And sometimes as, you know, as a Christian, we're like, oh, I'm already a Christian, I'm saved, I don't really need to, to seek God like that. But it's this continually seeking of our Heavenly Father. He, and He's always right there. He's right there with us. Deuteronomy 4.29 says this, but from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. God, I thank you that you have been gracious enough to allow us to find you. That you have a desire to be with us and for us to know you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to let go of those things that were continually worried about and anxious about, and instead seek you first. I thank you for your promises and that they are true and that you are faithful to your promises too. And we lack no good thing that we are fulfilled in you. You are all, our all in all, and we are so grateful for that. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, convince us of the truth. In Jesus' name.